right, so welcome to AP Biology on a Friday afternoon, a little bit. Uh, nice to see you all here. So um, uh, some good news. I have postponed your test until Wednesday the 28th. So I felt like you guys needed a little bit more time to digest some of this material. Some of you are, um, I think, getting a little overwhelmed and sometimes um, I don't think cell organelles are too difficult, but membranes and things flowing through membranes and gradients and math and, and everything can be uh, maybe taking a little bit more time. Yes, I was hoping that you would respond well to that. Okay, so yes, um, it is. there is going to be a little bit more time for us to go through what we need to go through for this. Um, and uh, today is a lab day. It's one of those days I really wish you could be in here with me and doing this hands-on thing, it would have been really nice. Instead, you'll get to watch what I filmed myself doing it. Um, a study guide. Uh, Julia, let me think about that. I'll write it down. Um, I think for the most part, um, I think I forgot to put the unit guide up for this unit. You're right. So I will make sure. There is one that exists. I will put it up for you. Uh, okay. Yes, no problem. Don't worry. Well, just like last time, right? I gave you a pretty detailed chem study guide. I'm hoping that that helped. Um, you do have one uh, um, topic in your in your Google Classroom that I'm trying to bring up to the top of your topic list that's all about the unit tests uh, and, um, and, and the current unit test and any materials I think might be good for you, I'm going to write there. Okay. Um, including the progress check on AP Classroom, remember, which is a practice test that you took last time, and I think that helped some of you to kind of get an idea what the questions are going to be like. Um, so I'll be putting that up probably this weekend if you wanted to go check that. It'll, it'll be uh, like a must-do, um, but it won't be graded for accuracy, so you can make mistakes on it and not worry, um, but it'll give you a good idea of what's going to be on it questions. Um, all right, so uh, what I wanted to do, what we're going to do today is um, we're going to um, look at a new topic, a new concept called water potential. Water potential is a way of measuring how much energy water has in a solution, and it turns out to be important for studying plants. If you ever get really into botany, uh, water potential is a way of studying um, how much energy the water molecules have in a solution and in particular inside plant cells, which have those cell walls, which um, exert pressure, and, and um, there's all kinds of things going on in a plant cell that isn't going on in an animal cell. So it becomes a driving force for water movement. And water movement in living things turns out to be really, really important. So um, last time, we were looking at um, sucrose solutions, solutions in dialysis tubing, right? Some of you got to that video, and some of you didn't. Um, and this time we're going to look at, we're going to try to discover the mystery uh, sucrose concentration of a potato. That's basically what today. So this whole week was a lab week. Uh, on, on the last time we were together, we were looking at dialysis tubing and how that works. And, and I did a, a bunch of uh, different colored solutions and had you figure out which was which. And then today I'm going to do another lab, a video lab for you, where I get into a potato and expose potato chunks to those same different sucrose solutions. And you have to figure out what the mystery solution inside the potato is. So um, let me just kind of review what we've done so far in terms of the labs this week. Some of you may have already seen those videos and know what I'm talking about, but some of you may be like, what? What's going on? I'm still doing 2.3 stuff. Catching up. Okay. So the first lab that we did was the mystery sucrose solutions in dialysis bags, right? That was the first week. That was the first one that you looked at, and some of you have looked at it, and some of you haven't. And then the other one that you're going to do today is a little bit related to it, but a little bit different. This is a all day. Um, we're just going to call it the potato soak lab. And the question is, is the sucrose similarity of a, of a potato? Okay. So these are the two sort of big labs this week. Um, it is a soak lab a little bit bigger than the mystery sucrose solutions. So this is what happened, all right? 
In the mystery sucrose lab, you had six cups. In those cups, I put tap water, just zero molar tap water in every single cup, right? And then I loaded these dialysis bags that, you know, if you watch that, then you know what I mean, a dialysis bag with increasing amounts of sucrose solution. Not increasing amounts, but increasingly concentrated solutions of sucrose. So maybe in this one, there was zero in there. And there was also zero out here, all tap water. And then in this next one, it was 0.2, and then 0.4, and then 0.5, and then point, uh, point 0.8, and then there was one more I'm leaving out, which was 1.0, which is the most concentrated sucrose solution of all. And then all of the outside solutions, all of the outside solutions are water. Everything's water. They're all in water. And then you saw over time which bags gained the most weight. So I think I may have gone over this already, but I just want to make sure. This, this situation here is isotonic, hypotonic, hypertonic. Which situation is this? Yes, that's isotonic. Beautiful. Okay, so this is isotonic. This is the only situation in this whole line of beakers that is. So this is the isotonic situa situation. So would we expect the bag to change mass? Yes or no? No. Very good, Krishna. Very excellent. Yes. <laughs> nope. Yes, correct. Okay. So this is the one where we would expect there to be no change in then what about this one way over here? What situation is this? It's tap water out here and 1.0 molar sticky sucrose inside. That is, it would gain, it would gain the most. Right, okay, so the greatest percent mass change would be here. And what situation is this? This water is what to the inside? Which tonicity? That's right, exactly, okay. So in this situation, we're getting increasingly hypotonic, right? And this is the one that's, um, and then there's an isotonic bag there. So let me just, because um, we discovered with the last class that the graphing sheet doesn't necessarily tell you what to put in the X and Y axis, and I want to make sure you know what to do. So the IV of this lab that would go on your X axis, what would the IV be? What is the scientist manipulating? The sucrose molarity. Very good. Okay. So sucrose molarity inside. Oh, I can never spell sucrose. Sucrose molarity on your X axis there. Okay. And then your DV is what? What is responding? What is what depends on that molarity? What's changing here as a result of the molarities you're putting in the bags? Mass, but not just mass. The Indira, yes? So for the zero molar solution, you would expect the mass not to change, but it decreased. You're right, it did. And that is because of experience little experimental variations and error that are bound to happen probably due to um different amounts of water that may have been on the outside of the bag when i weighed it the first time and the last time there's always variations there's there's the scale can can waver a little bit the amount of water on the outside of the bag can waver a little bit so there might be variations but even if you had whichever bag changed the least that's your zero molar bag. And that comes back to um, somebody said it was mass change, which is right, but it has to be percent mass, okay? Percent change in mass, which you have to calculate. That goes on your y axis, okay? 
but you have to use the spreadsheet to help you calculate that. And that is something that I can help you with if you need help with it. Um, but I want to go into water potential today. In any case, your graph for this, once you figure out which color is right, which is just a matter of um, you know, the most change, that, that was your 1.0 molar bag, um, whatever color that is, and your change, that's your zero molar bag. And in between, it's the gradations that go. And what you should have is you should have like the smallest change and then the next, a bar graph. Okay, fine. We didn't do any statistics with this. Right. So once you have figured out the color, which is goes on a different chart, then you're going to put the actual numerical molarities here. OK, so as the molarities increase, the amount of mass that the water that the bags gained will increase. So your percent change, right? Percent change goes there and molarities go here, not the colors. OK, the molarities. All right. So that's what that's what that should look like. OK, the potato soak lab. Now let's do that one because now you've got more cups. Some of you have already seen it. Good for you. You have the same sort of cup situation, in, except instead of putting dialysis tubing in there, you're going to put chunks of potato in there. And this time, you're going to put those colored solutions that you analyzed here, and you're going to surround the potatoes with those known solutions, right? So you're going to have potato chunks in here. And all those potatoes have the same sucrose molarity inside them. You just don't know what it is. That's what your job is to discover. So if this is, again, if the water out here now is changing, right? If you're putting increasingly known, increasingly concentrated quantities of sugar around those potatoes, you are changing the tonicity that each potato is being exposed to. And then the response of the potato is going to be to either lose or gain water, depending on what it's floating in. Right? There. All right. So we don't know what the, what the potato's molarity is. We don't know. That is our question. That is what you're going to try to discover. Um, and but it's what I will tell you is that when you go to put the data in, it's going to be very, very similar to the first lab where your IV is the sucrose molarity around the potato, right? And that goes on your X axis. And then your DV is the percent change in mass of the potato. And that goes on your y axis. There. Okay. In this case, a bar graph isn't going to be OK. You have to do a scatter for this. So, so your graph, and I'm not going to give you the answer here, but your graph is going to have a zero line right down the center like this. And I just did it myself in the, in the Spreadsheet will draw it for you. It'll be really great. Um, and it's gonna it, it's gonna do your data is gonna look like that, basically. Where in some of the cups the water is gonna gain mass, and in some of the cups it's gonna lose mass. And then in one of those cups, it's not gonna change, and that is a very significant um, value to to look for. Which is why you need a scatter plot and a line because you have interpolation to do. So I'm not going to give you any more of that, but now what I'm going to do is uh, we are going to watch a Mr. Anderson video together, together, all of us together. Um, and uh, you won't, you'll want to have your calculators out. It's not an ed puzzle. It's just you, we're all watching it together and learning together. And then after that, we'll take a break. OK, but you'll need to know how he explains water potential in order to, to better be able to do this and understand what you're doing. So I'm going to turn my mic off so you can hear better. Let me do that because that I get the audio that way. 
Let's turn that, okay. All right, turning my mic off, and I just want you to listen. Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this video, I'm going to talk about water potential, which is really what it sounds. It's the potential energy of water per unit area compared to pure water. So it allows us to figure out where water is going to flow due to osmosis, gravity, um, pressure, even surface tension. So it allows us to figure out if water is going to flow into the cell or not. And so we measure it using something called psi or PSI. And a quick way to remember that is that Poseidon was this Greek god of the oceans carried a trident and it looks a lot like the trident that we use to represent um, water potential or psi. Now psi is going to be equal to the psi which is solute potential and pressure potential but before I scare you off with a bunch of formulas let's get started talking about how water potential works. Let's first talk about osmosis and if you don't know this you may want to watch the video on osmosis but if you wanted to do something really cruel you could pour salt on a slug. Don't do it, it'll kill it, but what it would do is it would shrivel up that slug. And so what would happen is it would pull water out of the slug. Now why does that occur? Let's zoom in to the surface of the slug. So let's say this represents a cell membrane on the outside of the cells of the slug. We've got water on the outside, water on the inside, and let's say we add one crystal of sodium chloride or salt. Sodium chloride is going to be made up of two ions that are bonded together using an ionic bond. When we add that to the water, something weird happens. It'll break apart into their two ions. We've now got the chlorine ion and the sodium ion, the negative and the positive charge. And the negative charge is immediately going to be surrounded by the positive parts of the water, and the negative sides of the water are going to surround the positive sodium. But look what it did. It opened up all these areas to decrease the water potential above the slug or on the surface of the slug. So now we have areas where the water inside the slug can move into that. And it's more radical than I have in this simple kind of a diagram. And so what it's going to do is it's going to move water outside the slug. And so we measure water potential on either side of that membrane. On the outside, it's going to be negative 40 bars. And on the inside, it's going to be negative 5 bars. Now know this, pure water is going to be right at 0 bars of water Okay, so let me just uh, talk about that for just a second here. So the concept of water potential is a new one for you, and um, he's going to talk a little bit more about it, but what I want you to notice is that water potential tends to be a negative value. So this, um, this upper example where there's a chlorine ion and a sodium ion in the water, you see that because those ions are there, the more solutes you add, oh, okay, Okay, uh, I don't know why it would be doing that, but um, I'm just going to keep going, okay? Um, so the more solutes you put in a solution, the lower the water potential goes. So when you put salt in water, it causes the water molecules to get bound up, kind of get attached when they form those hydration shells. And as a result of that, that lowers the ability of water to move, the energy of the water molecules, and thus gives you a really very far negative water potential. So the pitchforks you're seeing there, that's the symbol psi, which means water potential. The one on the top, negative 40 bars, goes with the solution that has the The one on the bottom, yes, exactly, Julia, yes. So the one on the bottom goes with the of water that doesn't have any solutes in it, at least not that we can see. So you have to kind of make your head work backwards here. Which one of those values, the negative 40 or the negative 5, the higher water potential? The higher water potential. Think carefully. Yeah, that's it. And, and it's easy to make that mistake, right? Because 40 seems like a bigger number than 5. But think about the number line, which one's closer to zero, right? So negative five is actually a higher water potential than negative 40, which is way far away from zero. Think about your number lines when you were a little kid and bouncing along the number lines. I don't know if you remember that, but I remember doing that. Um, so, so 
pure water then is zero. That's actually the highest water potential of all is pure water. And the only way to make it to go even higher is to put pressure on the system, right? So if we put it in an autoclave or if we were inside a place that was cell walls there where there was a lot of turgor pressure, then you have, then you can go into the positives. But usually water potential is a negative value because almost always in nature, there's lots of solutes in water. So I'm just gonna let him keep going. Oh wait, I've gotta turn my, uh, right, okay. So that, that, well, hold on. No, the water would flow from, let me actually go to the, the picture and I'll show you. You can see my arrow, right? You can see this? So the water would flow from where it's higher here, water would flow from here to here. And that makes sense with what we talked about in terms of osmosis anyway, doesn't it? The water always flows towards where there's more solutes so as to dilute the other solution and go towards equilibrium. So you can talk about osmosis and water flow in terms of just gradients and where the more solutes are, right? In terms of this is high, hypotonic and this is hypertonic, water will always go towards where there's more dissolved substances. Or you can also talk about it in terms of water potential, where it will always flow from where it's higher at negative five bars to where it's lower at negative four bars. That was a really good clarifying question, whoever asked that. But it's always, to reach equilibrium and we're, remember we're always talking we're still talking about passive transport here right most of what we talk about in this class other than remember the sodium potassium pumps with the neurons most everything else is uh is all going to be about passive moving things move, things that move naturally because of gradients because gradients are driving them to move both of these your mystery sucrose and your potato labs are both about passive transport of water. Um, okay, so the bars, he's going to get to that. A bars is a pressure measurement. Um, so it's kind of a description of how much, uh, how it's, a, it's an energy description. And when he shows you the actual calculation, you'll see why we get to that. If you remember your gas laws um, from chemistry, do you remember that? Do you remember uh, PV equals NRT? That ring a bell? That R value. Yeah, that's right. Good. Okay, so it kind of connects to that a little bit because they're going to use that same R constant to help us calculate water potential. So let's let Mr. Um, Anderson. Potential. And so the water is going to flow from here into here. So the water is going to flow from an area of high water concentration to low co concentration or it's going to flow from an area of high water potential now to low water potential. And that's what you want to remember. Always going to flow from high to low water potential. So this drives water even up a tree. So if you were to pour some distilled water below a tree, it's going to have a water potential of zero bars. But the roots are going to be around negative two. And that's because they have a lot of solutes in, or salts inside them. And so the water is going to flow in through osmosis. But the stems are going to have even a greater excuse me, a lower water potential and the leaves as well and even the atmosphere. So the water is moving up a tree along this water potential gradient. Now what's driving that? We're evaporating all the water up at the top so there's not much water there at all. Really, really low water potential if we were to look at the leaves of a plant. So now let's get to those equations. So water potential is built on two things. It's built on the solute potential. And so think of that as like water flowing through osmosis and then the pressure potential, and that's like physical squeezing of the cell. So solute potential is going to drop as we increase the number of solutes in that area. So if I were to add just two little bits of sodium chloride or salt to it, what would that do to the solute potential? It's going to drop that. It's going to get a lower value. Why is that? Remember, we're opening up spaces in here for water. So we're going to have less water. Let's say we add a whole bunch of solutes to it. It's really going to decrease that solute potential. And so maybe it's going to be around negative five bars. So that's due to osmosis or that push of osmosis. What about the, the pressure potential? Well, that's a physical pressure. And so imagine that water keeps flowing into the cell. And let's make this a plant cell. So water is going to keep flowing in. That's going to push out on that cell. 
that doesn't explode, our cells would explode, but that has a cell wall around the outside of it. And so that wall is now going to start exerting a pressure to the inside. And so what that's going to do is create what's called a pressure potential. And so we measure that in bars as well. So let's say that's two bars. Why is it a positive value? Remember, that's going to be pushing in. It's going to want to push water out of that kind of an area. Sorry, thank you. All right, thank you for telling me. Um, all right, so here's here's a classic mathematical, a really easy, <laughs> a really easy math problem to do about water potentials. Let's say they give you a problem and they say, okay, so we have we have a situation in this in this beaker with the cells in the beaker where the solute potential is negative five and the pressure potential is two bars because they stuck a little tiny meter inside the plant and they and they got the turgor pressure inside those plant cells and they measured it. And they say, okay, what's the total? The total uh, potential is you add these two values up and it's just an integer problem. So what would be the answer? That's it, yes, negative three bars, beautiful. Negative five plus two is negative three. That's it. That's that's an easy type of problem. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated, though, when um, when you go into the calculation of the solute potential, which is what we're going to be doing next. And so those two things, if we add those together, is going to be our water potential. What would be the water potential in this case? It would be negative five bars plus two bars. So it's going to be negative three bars. That's the overall water potential. And those two things are going to determine if water flows into a cell or doesn't. Sometimes you'll be asked to do a little bit more detail here on the solute potential. And there's an equation for that, which in my class I would not want you to memorize. But let's throw that up here right now. So solute potential is equal to negative I CRT. So we got to through each of those parts, the I, the C, the R, and the T. Let's start with the ionization constant. Ionization constant is not going to have units associated with it. It's just a factor. It's always going to be somewhere from one to two, sometimes including one. And so if we were to, to look at sodium chloride, remember sodium chloride is one molecule when it's outside of the water, but when you add it to the water, it's going to break apart into two ions. And so the reason we're multiplying it times two is if you add one mole of sodium chloride, it's really like adding one mole of chloride ion and one mole of sodium ion. And so we have to multiply that times two. That's really easy if we're dealing with something like sucrose, which is just table sugar. That's going to have an ionization constant of one. Because when you add sugar to water, it just stays as sugar. So we don't have to multiply anything. So again, if we increase the ions, we're increasing the I. And that's going to give us a lower solute potential. OK, what about concentration? Obviously, the more of the stuff we add to the water, that's going to increase uh, or decrease, rather, the solute potential. And so moles per liter in concentration is going to be what we measure for C. And so if you add the, the molarity, so let's say something is a one molar solution, that means there's one mole per liter. Next thing we have in our equation is the pressure constant. Pressure constant is just that. It's always going to be the exact same thing, and it's always going to be 0 0.0831. I would memorize it. These, um, these units at the end are going to be important as we solve a quick problem. And then the next one's going to be the temperature. Obviously, it's important that we, if we increase the concentration, that that's going to decrease solute potential. But if we increase temperature, then the molecules are going to be bouncing around more readily, and so that's also going to decrease our water potential. And so when we measure that in this equation, we use it Kelvin. And so what you're going to do is take the Celsius degrees and add 273. If you don't do that, you're simply going to get the wrong answer. And so knowing that, let's throw you a quick problem. So let's say we have a molar concentration of sugar solution in an open beaker. That'll become important in just a second. It's a 0.2 molar uh, concentration. And what they're asking you to do is calculate the solute potential of 22 degrees Celsius. OK, so get your calculators out and plug and chug this one. You can do it. Remember, the answer is always going to be negative. So leave a negative sign in there. 
I, since this is sucrose, is just going to be one because sucrose doesn't dissociate. It stays as one molecule. C is the molarity of, um, of the solution, which they say is 0.2 molar. R is a constant value that's listed right here, point, uh, 0 0.0831 on the sheet next to you. And T is the temperature in degrees Kelvin. So not Celsius. So the 22 degrees here, you need to convert to Kelvin by adding 270 to it. All right, you guys are so fast. <laughs> okay. Okay. I just want to make sure everybody gets a chance. I don't want to rush you. Some of you are so fast, but some of you need more time. I was, the, I was one of the ones that needed more time. <clears throat> always I was not good enough at all everybody would already already have all their calculations done and I'd be like what 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 are you doing that was me so if that's you don't feel bad it happen to anybody um okay so I'm going to go ahead and say the correct answer actually I'm going to let Mr. Anderson be the correct So on the AP exam, you're going to get these two things. They're going to give you water potential, which we already went over. That's equal to the pressure potential plus the solute potential. They're going to explain that here. And then this is even the equation for the solute potential, which is negative I CRT. So how do you solve that? Let me show you how I would solve it. First thing I would do is I would plug everything in. What's my I? My I is going to be 1. Um, that's just because we're dealing with sugar. And since sugar, remember, doesn't ionize, we're just going to put in one because it stays as sucrose or stays as sugar. Where did I get this one? This is my concentration. That's 0.2 moles per liter because they gave me 0.2 molarity as the concentration. Next thing is going to be my pressure constant. I'm simply copying that off the sheet. We've got it right here. And then I'm going to have my temperature. Since they told me it was 22 degrees Celsius, I'm adding that to 273. So I get 290. So first thing to do is to get rid of all of these units. So for example, we have Cal uh, Kelvin here on the bottom and we have it on the top. Likewise, we've got liters on the top, liters on the bottom. First thing I would do is I would cancel out all those units. What am I left with? Not surprisingly, bars. That's going to be what we measure solute potential in. Next thing I would do is I'd put the bars on the end and then I would multiply those values. And so what I get is negative 4.9029 bars. So that's way too many significant digits. If I go back to my question, this one only has one significant digit, 0.2. So my answer should really be negative 5 bar. And so I've quickly figured out the solute potential. But I could also ask you this question. What's the overall water potential? Okay, so we're going to have to think about this a little bit. We've got the solute potential. And again, that's going to be half of this water potential. What's the other half? It's on pressure. So how much pressure are we going to have on a beaker that's open? We're going to have zero pressure on it. And so if I want to figure out my overall pressure, I'm just going to add those together. So it's also going to be negative 5 bars. So that's water potential. It, again, it measures where water is high as far as potential energy of water and allows us to figure out where they go. If you can remember that and remember our friend Poseidon, um, you can do well on all of these problems. And I hope that was helpful. Okay, so that was a lot of information, a lot of new information. You need a break right now, so I'm going to put up a five-minute timer. I want you to go away from your screen, do some stretching, do some arm, arms, get your blood flowing again. Okay, when you come back, you're just going to look at me doing the potato lab and, and maybe do a few problems, and then we're done for the day. Okay, but I want you to take a break right now. I'm serious, just walk away from me and go take a break. I'll put a little thing on here. Take a break.